Hello, hello, 164 scale diecasters. I got a little vi different video than usual. Uh, historically, I've been doing uh, videos on European and Japanese cars in out of production diecast models because I'm new to this hobby and I figured I'd pick up the old stuff because it's just going to get more expensive, you know, being old out of print uh, models. But I had some gift certificates and I had to use them this month, so I used that as an excuse to pick up these brand new American cars and one German car. Uh, historically, I've kind of shied away from green light because they have those painted on headlights. I do have the Datsun BRE, but the uh, painted, printed on headlights are kind of weird looking. But these don't have that issue. So anyways, let's uh, get into these unboxings here and we'll learn a little bit about these vehicles. I'm going to close up here, get better light here for you guys. Pull out the spinning thing here, a little CD coaster. And I'll try to start in... Uh, logical order of the the car itself so this is an old car it's a 1949 mercury 8 custom and uh for you young kids that don't know what a mercury is a mercury is a brand that was put out by ford and it's supposed to be a little bit higher class than the ford models but still lower than lower than the lincoln models but when i was a kid i'm not sure if anyone believed that to be true we knew that Lincolns were nicer than Fords, but me and my friends, we never really thought a Mercury was better, that much better, than a Ford itself. Uh, so again, this is my first uh, model from M2, so I'm going to actually take this off the base because I'm curious what goes on on the bottom of these things. I've generally been trying to buy Kyoshos, the ones that are all out of print. So anyways, I do like this about this brand all of a sudden. Uh, it shows 2019 Cast Line Inc. And then it shows 1949 Mercury. So what I love about that is I know when this thing was roughly made. And then I actually know what the car is. A lot of these older models I'm buying uh, used off eBay and whatnot. They just have blank bottoms or they don't tell you what the car is. So you're not really learning about much if you don't know what the vehicle is. Anyways, uh, this hood looks like a separate piece but... I'm not sure if it opens. I haven't actually done any research on this uh, die cast. But it definitely looks cool. It's got a metallic green flake. And then all these cool uh, custom painted graphics. You know, the pinstriping. Really cool printed out uh, flames there. And there's some sort of text here underneath the window. I can't make it out. It's just so small, even to the naked eye. But it's there. It must be the driver's name. So I would have to assume maybe this car was modeled after someone's personal car. And that's the owner of this particular uh, vehicle. So if you're familiar with uh, hot rodding and stuff like that, which I'm not really. Uh, this Mercury, this particular generation 3 of the Mercury 8. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, it is a third generation. It was after World War II. This has been pretty much the typical use of a lead sled they call these lead sleds I guess so it definitely I can understand it being a sled it definitely looks pretty low to the ground here uh, this sort of thing was popularized by the brothers Sam and George Barris so it's still popular today and I guess there are even uh, body uh, kit cars of this car nowadays so, anyways, it's really cool. I like this model. I also like how it says 1949 on the license plate. So I have a better idea, you know, how old this thing is. It's very educational. It's interesting that there are no taillights at all. I'm not sure if the real car this may have been modeled after, if they just shaved them off. Maybe they're underneath the fender. Don't know. Underneath the bumper. Anyways, it looks cool. So we'll let that spin on as I open the packaging of the next car, which is a Jeep CJ5. And uh, this was manufactured by a couple different companies, Willys and AMC Motor. And you'll notice this packaging, there's Elvis on it. And the reason why is there's a movie with Elvis and Nancy Sinatra called Tickle Me. I never saw it, but uh, apparently this Jeep was in that movie. And uh, I was just checking out some research on this. 
1965 model. It's a it has a special package with different wheels than the standard Jeep CJ5 of the time. And it's called the Tuxedo Park 4 edition. So okay, so here we go. Let's look at this closely. Focus, come on. Alright. So this is a 1965 Jeep, I guess. And I guess the wheels here, sorry, this tripod is actually just like a selfie stick kind of tripod. These wheels are different than the standard one. I guess that's what they're trying to upsell you with the tuxedo package. It's very interesting to have such a narrow rear seat there. Maybe for two kids, I guess. And then I'm assuming the casting itself is, you know, they have a hard top for other types of uh, liveries from this particular diecast brand and I assume that little peg hole must be for like a spare tire or something like that on some other CJ5s offered by by Greenlight but yeah I looked at the you know headlights and thankfully this thing has clear plastic inserts so it looks pretty realistic you can see the depth of the headlights which is really nice I like it the turn signals are painted but yeah, it's better than nothing, you know, at least half half of the lights being plastic. Pretty wide tires there, but I do like the fact that there's tread on them. Some details there, the hood latches, tie downs. Not sure what this little graphic is, but I would assume it must be on the movie car. So the Jeep printing there. I'm assuming that block of text on the hood here must be tuxedo. Tuxedo Park 4. Uh, no painting on the dashboard, but I guess that's okay for the, the price point. But they did paint the uh, windshield wipers, so that's a nice touch. The bottom, so I guess this is number 1232 of maybe a pr limited production. It does say CJ5, Jeep CJ5, and it says 2017, so maybe that's when this mold was made. So this is great information. I really like that. I like to know what these vehicles are that I'm buying. And no. I know my dots in the hood opens, but this one does not. It's just a separate piece for the grill, so that you see this gap there. Okay, well anyways, let's put that on here. Move on. I guess we'll move keep that there for you guys. So the next one is a 1967 Chevy Camaro with a crazy paint job. That's what made me buy this particular die cast. I mean, I do love the first generation Camaro, which is this thing. But uh, this paint job is just really neat. And I don't know who Mr. Bardall is. That's what's written on the packaging. So I looked it up online. And it turns out, the history of this car... First, you gotta start with the dealerships. So in California, there was a line of dealerships called Dana Chevrolet. I'm not sure if they're still an active business or not, but they're arguably the first uh, dealership on the West Coast, maybe in all of America, to drop a 400, a 427 cubic inch v engine into these uh, Camaros, making them really real muscle cars, whereas a stock Camaro would have had just a a six cylinder or a lower displacement V8. But anyways, uh, it's called on the packaging Mr. Bardall because uh, there's a company that still exists today. They're based out of Seattle, Washington called Bardall Lubricants and they make all sorts of motor oils and all the uh, fluids that you buy at auto parts stores. You know, fuel injection cleaner, that kind of stuff. So I guess this was a uh, Purchased by the owner of the company, maybe, and uh, you got this crazy uh, paint job going on, and these little 16-inch uh, Krager wheels here. I do. Let's get to the actual diecast now. It says Goodyear. It's, it's printed on these rear tires, but not the front, which is weird. All right? Is it? In, I'm trying to see if it's on the inside. There, it's not. So that's really weird that the, the rear tires, both rear tires say Goodyear, but both front tires are just blank. Yet they're running the same size wheels. But, uh, you know, maybe that's what really happened on the real car. This is modeled after a real car. Oh, there is a name here, Bill Heisler. Must have been the driver of this. 
hmm, I'm just speculating. So if, if you guys know the history of this car, you know, pop it into the comments. I'm sure more than I would want to know. So the hood on this must open, of course. Uh, there we go. There's a big gap, so that's why I think it could open. So we got the uh, orange engine, a little silver painted uh, air filter. Yeah, sorry, it's just too dark in there to get a good impression. All right. Well, I'm looking at the paint now, and I don't see any like dust or any imperfections really in underneath the paint, which is nice. That seems to be the case with some other brands. It's interesting, these graphics are not really, I don't think they, it doesn't feel like they painted over this silver and pink graphic. I can feel the resistance sliding my finger over, whereas it's super smooth in the metallic blue, which, you know, because it's clear coated. So I almost feel like when they made this model, they painted it this blue, clear coated it, and then applied this graphic on top of it. So I bet you could easily scratch that off. So keep that in mind if you guys buy this car. I think you might be able to scratch this graphic off. So you probably don't want to throw it into a box of other cars or it's going to get all chipped away. So the taillights are painted as uh, this company is known to do. But they're pretty thin, so it doesn't bother me so much. And then, you know, there's no actual need to have plastic inserts on the front because that's just the way this particular Camaro, Camaro looks. All right, so, well, very nice. Okay, so let's go on here. I know my videos, I think, tend to ramble on. So I'm not sure if you guys think I should maybe talk less and get through the videos quicker. But I know a lot of other great video reviewers do that. So I just thought I'd talk more and, you know, share information about the vehicles so we could learn a little bit. But anyways, the next one I'm cutting up here off screen is the 69 Dodge Charger Daytona. And uh, it's called a Daytona after Daytona Beach, Florida, which is kind of like a known for automotive influence because of, oh sorry if you know about anything about nascar the daytona 500 is still a very popular key event on the uh, nascar calendar so but back in 1969 they took a charger and they made these aerodynamic modifications so there's a 23 inch tall wing here in the back which is why it looks so ridiculous and uh, there's a sheet panel nose cone instead of a more flat nose like on this. You know, if you look up a regular charger, it's generally vertical. So that's obviously more aerodynamic than a flat wall having this uh, cone. And then the, the rear glass also is flush with the bodywork. Whereas a, a standard charger, it's more, more vertical. It's not vertical, but it's angled steeper than this. So those are some of the aerodynamic modifications that uh, were put on this car. And it did lead to some success. It won two races in uh, 1969, I think. Yeah. And then it won four more in 1970. And then uh, other there are three, three other aerodynamic cars, I guess, of the time. And so NASCAR just changed the rules. They put an end to it. Because the, these uh, modifications on this car allowed this thing to break the 200 mile per hour barrier and I think it was the very first car in NASCAR to break the 200 mile per hour barrier with a, a driver Buddy Baker back in 1970 at a Talladega race so yeah I guess I can understand them banning the mods because NASCAR in most racing federations they try to keep racing as equal as possible because if something dominates racing so much that nothing else wins, it, it it just doesn't lend itself well to the concept of racing where people are trying to compete. So, okay, well anyways, looking at the actual model now, yeah, there's a little blemish here in the black where the wing goes into that deck there. Very th the thin taillights, again, that doesn't bother me. Uh, Nice little silver mufflers or exhaust tips and the white painted 
backup lights. Just a blank license plate that was staying the same color. That could have been maybe white or something, but nice crisp printing here, Daytona on that stripe. You know, the keyhole, or well, the key lock, and then the door handle are painted. Kind of sloppy here on the chrome trim around the wheel wells, though. Uh, you can see the orange cut through there and back here, so it wasn't painted very well on this side. What about the other? The other side's fine. So I guess it's bad luck on my part of getting this one. It says charger there. Fuel filler cap there. Some uh, front hood quick release uh, studs for the, the front hood. Nice uh, nice molding here of the uh, vent, li vent lines here. The windshield wiper is kind of weak though. They're painted the same silver as the window surround. I don't know, maybe the real car had chrome uh, windshield wiper bodies, so it's possible that's accurate. And then some sort of printed on mesh grill, I guess, there. I lived in Colorado a long time ago, and my neighbor was like some sort of used car dealer. One day I walked out my front door, and there was a blue one of these in this driveway. So that was very memorable. Maybe that's why that kind of made me buy this thing. It is also a ridiculous looking car. Look how long it is with that nose cone. And then just the ridiculous height of that rear wing. So I like ridiculous things. In particular, ridiculous cars, I guess. So, very nice. All right. Which leads us to the last one now. Make sure that's focused for you guys. So, the one non-American car is the Volkswagen Type 2 van. And the Volkswagen vans are still sold today. I think they're to the fifth generation, the T5 now. But uh, this thing is called a Type 2 because the Volkswagen Beetle was originally called the Type 1. So this is their second model, or second product offering by Volkswagen. It's this uh, van. It's actually built on the same chassis. So it has a, a rear engine, like a Volkswagen Beetle. By today's standards, it doesn't make much sense. But way back then, it made sense. And actually, the history of how this... Oh, that's horrible. The history of this vehicle, how it came about, there was a Dutch importer named Ben Pon. And... Uh, he went to the factory to order some uh, Beetles and then thought it might be good to have like a van version. So he sketched one out. And once uh, Volkswagen caught up with the demand for the Beetle, they decided to make a van version of it. So I thought that was interesting to learn. Uh, this being a 1975 model, it's actually the gener second generation of the the van. The first generation had a V-shaped split wind windscreen. Now it's just one continuous piece of glass. And uh, the history, you know, the production of this it runs a long time. Uh, it actually ran up until 2013 because there's a factory in Brazil still manufacturing this thing. So that's a long uh, time of production because the very first Type 2 came out in 1950. So that's a very long production. So we're going to have the castings now. Definitely a... I don't know if that's glue. Yeah, yeah, I think it comes off. There's some sort of glue residue there on the, the roof. I do like the Gulf livery. It just makes me think of the, the GT40s of the 60s. But uh, this bumper, I'm surprised I didn't catch that at the shop. I think this is the only Gulf livery there, so I just got excited by the livery and I decided to buy this. I didn't actually inspect it in the packaging at the store. You know, there's a giant scrape here in the graphic on the back there. On a plus side, there's some really nice printing right there on the on the back of this. Whatever that says, I can't make it out with the naked eye. And again, I like the plastic insert headlights, which is great. What I don't like is the fact that this is scratched right here, showing this orange underneath it. So again, this, they seem to have painted this orange, painted a gloss over it, and then they added the graphics on top of that gloss. 
which would explain why that scratch is there, because it's really easy to scratch. Same with back here. If this was glossed after this printing, none of these problems would exist, because the gloss coat would protect this, this grayish printing on there. So, if budget allows, I would recommend to Greenlight if they, in the random really small chance that someone from Greenlight watches this video, if the budget allows, you know, paint the thing, clear coat it, or really paint it and add the graphics before you clear coat it. You know, the purpose of clear coat is to protect the paint underneath it, right? So I don't see why you couldn't just gloss over this printed on these printed on graphics to protect those okay well anyways I like the wheels it says VW just like the real thing so that's nice and I do like the fact I know when it was made I know what the vehicle is it's actually pretty nice detail here underneath not I really don't care about bottom detail because I'd never display it upside down but uh, I guess it's nice if it's doable, why not? But yeah, this bumper is just a disaster. I don't think I can fix it. I'm gonna have to. Ch I don't know what to do about that. I don't know. So that's that's too bad. I guess since I have four green lights here, so that means 25% is bad meaning this one. The other three are, are fully acceptable. I can live with it. But this one is a big letdown, unfortunately, on the quality control. Had it not had any of these quality control problems, yeah, it'd be a great model. Oh well. Alright, well, I guess I'll check you guys later. See ya.